Episode 18 of Wasteland Weaponistics. This episode is all about the AER series of laser rifles and its derivatives. The AER series of laser weapons were first seen in Fallout 3 and have reappeared in Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4, and Fallout 76 at the time of making this video. There's a lot of information to go through in this episode, so if I miss anything or get any information wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments section. While throughout the entire Fallout series, many different laser and energy weapons have been featured, the AER series introduced by Bethesda with Fallout 3 has become one of the most iconic laser rifles in the wasteland. The weapon was designed by Adam Adamowicz, Bethesda's one-time concept artist who unfortunately passed away in 2012 due to lung cancer. Adam designed many of the most iconic weapons of ar and armor we see in Bethesda's games. So let's get into the lore. Firstly, let's go over what we know about the pre-war lore of the AER series. The AER series is a highly modular platform that can be configured for a variety of different roles, which gives it an advantage over other laser weapons. When equipped with different muzzles and barrels, it can be formed as a CQC PDW, a long-range sniper rifle, or even a full auto. In short, I would call the AER series the laser rifle equivalent of the real-life XM8 modular rifle, if anybody remembers how popular that was in video games. Pre-war, the AER series saw heavy use by the U.S. military. In the pre-war cutscene and the, in the beginning section of Fallout 4, we see multiple U.S. soldiers equipped with the laser rifle. Both standard infantry as well as power armor soldiers are equipped with them. The most common version that is usually just called laser rifle is the AER-9. Where the AER-1 through 8 are, I couldn't tell you as there's no information on these. What we do know is that the AER series is manufactured by General Atomics. In Fort Independence, located in Washington, D.C., there is a pre-war terminal with an entry by a researcher known as J.T. Benning. Further research regarding laser weaponry has not revealed much we didn't already know. Small production run of prototype weapons developed by U.S. military. Most of these weapons were recovered from military armories where the weapons were being tested by live fire groups of active duty personnel. Power drawn from microfusion cells is processed through a wave slash particle diverter, manufactured Gen Atomics International, General Atomics International. Diverters are protected by carbon fiber housing, preventing frequent malfunction, but when a diverter fails, the weapon becomes unusable, and this part is extremely difficult to replace or repair. Precision cut lenses focus optic energy. Lenses are prone to damage and can grossly affect precision of the firing weapon mechanism. Lenses are easily replaced with clear glass, but require a great deal of skill to fabricate. A fully charged cell will discharge 20 bolts from a pistol and 12 shots from the rifle model. Recoil is negligible compared to ballistic weapons, so long-range combat requires less marksmanship ability of the soldier. The chassis are easily opened, allowing the weapon to be serviced in the field. Purified water and a clean cloth can be used to wash mirrored and glass components, slowing wear on the weapon. The weapon can overheat after a period of intense use. This can be counteracted by submerging the barrel of the weapon in water, which helps cool heat sinks located beneath the chassis cell in the area. You can also find advertisements for the AER-9 by General Atomics. Another example is on the cover of Guns and Bullets magazine. There is an issue about laser weapons and hunting. From these we know that the AER series was in the hands of both pre-war military units and civilians alike. The AER-9 can also be found in multiple of the vault tech vaults. While not every vault was supplied with these weapons, they exist in more than just a one-off case. Since the AER-9 was so popular and widespread, other manufacturers and individuals are going to modify the weapon for their own needs. There are many different modifications one can do to the standard AER-9. You can turn it into a large pistol, a full auto assault rifle, a PDW, or even a sniper. One modification that has existed throughout most of the series is the beam splitter. In Fallout 3's Capital Wasteland, the beam splitter is a separate weapon known as the Tri-Beam Laser Rifle. This rifle also exists in the Mojave Wasteland, but New Vegas also features the beam splitter which can be put on regular AER-9s. 
There are many other uniquely modified AER9s, and because there are so many unique ones, I'm going to separate them into pre-war and post-war uniques. Usually pre-war uniques will have model names, consisting of numbers, while most post-war uniques will have fantasy style names, but this is not always the case. Pre-war, the standard AER9 was not the only version of the series. There exists a reference to an AER12. In the Citadel, the pre-war Pentagon, there is a terminal entry for the AER series, which mentions both the AER9 and the AER12. Unlike many of the weapons in use today, the AER9 is actually not the top laser rifle that was in service at the time of the Great War. The model line went up to the state-of-the-art AER-12, which saw service in a handful of specialty units. The reason that the AER-9 is much more commonly found is that it was much dirtier and more reliable than the models that followed. The AER-9 features a titanium-housed crystal array which proved to withstand long years of exposure to the elements much better than the gold alloy housing of the later models. As a result, the crystal array stayed focused within operating parameters, rather than falling completely out of focus like newer models. As with all energy weapons, the AER-9 can suffer from poor for performance if not properly maintained. The crystal array and non-mechanical components are delicate and if not properly in service can lead to a loss of beam intensity, overheating, and energy regulation failure. From this terminal, we know why we find so many AER-9s and AER-9 variants compared to AER-12s and other models. It's because the AER-9 was just so much more durable than the future models. These are not in any particular order, but here are all the pre-war unique AER-9s. Fallout 4's prototype UP-77 Limitless Potential, found in the University Credit Union vault in Boston. This prototype, I believe, is pre-war, simply because of its location and how the player has to acquire it. The weapon is locked behind two terminals, a unique button locked in a safe, which then unveils a hidden wall leading to a room, where the player then finds a laser gun, which is just laying on the table with, with some ammo. This prototype has the endless effect, making it so that the user never has to reload the weapon. There is no lore on this weapon that I can find, so this is all fan fiction, but from the name, and its location, we can deduce that the UP part of the name means University Point, where the credit union is located, and the 77 is the year meaning 2077. The UP 77 can spawn with any amount of random attachments, so it might spawn as a pistol or a rifle. Nice. Number 2, Fallout 76's Acceptable Overkill. This one has a unique name instead of a model number, so it sounds like it should be a post-war unique, but this laser rifle is found on a pre-war magazine. The issue of Guns and Bullets I mentioned earlier features a laser rifle. In the bottom print, it says Acceptable Overkill. This rifle is the one mentioned and depicted on the front of this issue of Guns and Bullets, a pre-war magazine. Acceptable Overkill was a survival reward weapon in Fallout 76, which is no longer acquirable as survival mode was cut from the game, and sadly I was not able to acquire it at the time. To receive this weapon, you had to kill a beaver, a squirrel, a fox, and a rabbit in Fallout 76's survival mode. This would reward you with acceptable overkill laser rifle. This laser rifle has three effects. It does 30% more damage to animals, critical shots do 50% more damage, and it gives you plus one perception. Number three, Fallout New Vegas' AER-14. While we never see the AER-12, we do see the AER-14. The AER-14 is a pre-war prototype and the highest known version of the AER series. The AER-14 features a powerful green laser. It also has a different color paint job and uses two mo microfusion cells per shot instead of one. It also has a bunch of wiring on the gun. It is found in Vault 22, the plant-infected vault of the Mojave Wasteland. It's not locked in any safe, but found next to a dead skeleton. The previous wielder desperately trying to defend themselves from the plant-based horrors of this vault. This weapon was designed by Josh Sawyer. Here is his comment on it. I designed it. The science and the math involved here were the result of me doing some basic research and consulting with a friend who was experienced in laser physics. As for why I did it in the first place, to paraphrase Charles Eames, details aren't details, details are the design. It seems to be another one of Josh Sawyer's weapons he just thought would be cool 
to do like the Laser RCW. For why the AER-14 prototype is in Vault 22, I can't answer that. It could be that the weapon wasn't originally found in this vault, and the dead body we find it on was an explorer who brought the rifle with him or her, only to die on the stairs of this vault. Number 4, Fallout 4's Cosmic Cannon. The Cosmic Cannon is from Fallout 4's Creation Club. Keep in mind the strange cannon status of the Creation Club. Emil Pagliarulio said it earlier in 2020 that the Creation Club is semi-canon or more parallel to canon, so it's in a very weird spot in canon. The Cosmic Cannon is part of the Captain Cosmos pack. It is a very unique version of the AER. It's mocked up to look like a weapon the Fallout comic hero Captain Cosmos would use. It has three unique firing modes, a standard blue laser beam, a cryolator style freezing spray, or even a sonic blast. The weapon was sent to this film studio by the US Air Force and United States Space Administration. The cosmic cannon was used during filming which caused an accident because of the live fire ammunition, it severely injuring one of the actors, Johnny Morton. Johnny Morton can be found as a ghoul inside of the studio. Whether the gun turned him into a ghoul or not isn't said. But this weapon is interesting. If it was given to the film studio by the US Air Force, could this weapon be the fabled AER-12? These attachments would fit a specialized unit. Just some theory crafting, tell me what you think. This ends the pre-war segment of the video, now we're going to get into the post-war years. In the post-war period of the United States, we can see the AER-9 has become very widespread with everyone from major factions to lowly scavengers wielding them. The Brotherhood of Steel makes heavy use of laser weapons, no matter which chapter. The Mojave, the Appalachian, the DC, and the Boston chapters all equip their units with AER-9s. The DC version of the Enclave also makes use of AER-9s. Mercenary factions such as Talon Company and the Gunners also have units equipped with AER-9s. Everyone's favorite big green super soldiers, the Supermunes, no matter what strain, have AER-9s. In fact, the Tribeam laser rifle found in Fallout 3, since it was added with broken steel and not a base game weapon, only Supermutant overlords are equipped with these very powerful laser rifles. In the post-war year, several factions have been able to make new variants that are more widespread than one than one-off uniques. One of the earliest versions of these comes from the, a former Appalachian Brotherhood member. Hank Madigan, a former US Marine who joined the Appalachian Brotherhood after the Great War, only to leave the faction and join the responders. During his time in the Brotherhood, he found out how depleted Ultrasight could be used to deal extra damage to Scorch Beasts and infected Scorch creatures, creating both Ultrasight bullets and Ultrasight laser weapons. Ultrasight laser weapons fire a unique green laser because of the green Ultrasight crystals embedded in the weapon. Another post-war faction that was able to create new variants of the AER is the Commonwealth Minutemen. Using the barrel portion of the AER-9, the laser musket was created. The laser musket is a powerful single-shot weapon that has to be charged, cranked, after every shot. However, it can be charged additional times, increasing the damage of that shot. Why they created the laser musket is a mystery. Did they take working laser rifles apart just to make an aesthetic weapon? Or are they made from unrepairable ones? This next one, I'm not sure if it should be included in the AER series. While it does seem to be closely based on the AER, it is different. That is the Institute laser rifle. The Institute laser rifle is similar to the AER rifle, using a similar setup with fusion cores and features the same style of modifications. However, in the concept art, there is a description that says the Institute developed their own laser technology, but because of our firing and reload animations needed to be shared with standard laser sets, this design was based on the same overall positioning for the animation touch points. So while many things about the Institute laser rifle look like it should be a future variant of the AER series, but as those comments here says it's not, and it's only similar because they wanted to reuse animations. Not the first time Bethesda has not wanted to make new animations. There are many examples of this. One example is the M79 grenade launcher in Fallout 76, 
as it just uses double barrel shotgun animations. We see that in the post-war years, several factions were able to semi-mass produce additional variants, but the individual Tinkerer has also produced several versions as well. This next list of uniques were all created post-war, or seemingly created post-war. Number 1, the Fallout 3 Metal Blaster. Extremely powerful laser rifle acquired from the pit raider Everett, after giving him 50 steel ingots. He has a short comment on the rifle when he gives it to you. Hey, bit of a weird one here. Found it from some suck out of town. Some genius got to tinkering with his laser. Polished metal barrel, a few prisms in there, and he got this lethal light show. Whoever ever got the metal blaster from is a bit of a mystery. Sucker from out of town is all we know. It could be from the Brotherhood of Steel when they made their way through the pit, or just some random wastelander. But whoever it was really knew how to modify our laser rifle. The metal blaster is extremely powerful. The rifle acts like a long range volley fire gun, shooting nine blasts at once. This is sort of like the beam splitter muzzle attachment we see in Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4, and 76. Except the metal blaster is different and much more powerful. Each beam from the metal blaster can crit. Other than that, the gun is a reference to the third Mad Max movie, Beyond Thunderdome. As there are two characters named Master and Blaster. <laughs> Number two, the Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, the Wazer Rifle and the Wazer Wifle. The Wazer Wifle has appeared twice in the Fallout series. Both times it is acquired from children. In Fallout 3, you can buy the Wazer Wifle from Bowie. And Fallout 4 is acquired from doing Radiant Quests for the synth version of Sean. While they do share the same name, they have different effects. In Fallout 3, it has slightly higher capacity of 30 compared to the standard 24, does 5 more points of damage, and is 80% more durable. In Fallout 4, much like the UP-77 I mentioned, the Wazer Rifle here has a never-ending effect, meaning it never has to reload. How each of these children came to possess these unique rifles is unknown. In Fallout 4, did Synth Sean steal it from the Institute before being teleported out? In Fallout 3, how did Bowie acquire this rifle? He mentioned he was part of the Little Lamplight scavenger team, but was kicked off and says he doesn't need the rifle anymore. So he sells it to you. He doesn't seem smart enough to have made it, so his version could have been made pre-war. Number 3, the Fallout New Vegas Van Graaff laser rifle. This rifle bears the name of the energy weapon dealers known as the Van Graaffs in New Vegas. This is the reward for completing the Birds of a Feather quest. The player can choose between a laser rifle or a plasma rifle. The strange thing about this laser rifle it is that, that it's much worse than a standard one. It does less damage, is less durable, and has less of a critical chance. I have a feeling that somehow the Van Graffs actually manufactured this one. Number 4, Fallout 4's Protectron's Gaze. A unique AER-9 acquired from the Fallout 4's version of the Mechanist. The Protectron Gaze features the Rapid ability, giving it faster rate of fire and a faster reload. I know the Mechanist is a smart gal, so I'm going to go ahead and say she made this, and she also made the suit and modifies robots. In Fallout 3, there is also a laser pistol with the same name, but the pistol in Fallout 3 in New Vegas is the AEP, which is different than the pistol configuration for the AER. Number 5, Fallout 4's Old Faithful. An AER-9 that is sold by the vendor Arturo in Diamond City. Old Faithful has the instigating effect, which doubles the damage of the first hit. Fallout 4 Survival Special, one of the uniques belonging to the Brotherhood of Steel. The Survival Special belongs to the former Brotherhood Paladin, Paladin Brandis, who went AWOL after his recon team was killed. During the quest, you can get him to rejoin the Brotherhood of Steel, and if successful, you are rewarded the Survivor Special. This unique feature is the fabled bloodied effect, increasing your damage as your health lowers. Fun fact about Paladin Brandis, he is voiced by everyone's favorite skeleton face bad guy, Skeletor. Alan Oppenheimer voices Paladin Brandis. Number 7, Fallout 4's Righteous Authority. Another unique weapon from the Brotherhood of Steel. Righteous Authority belongs to the synth Paladin, Paladin Dance. It is acquired after completing the quest Call to Arms. 
We know it's a post-war modification because Dance even says it's his personal modification of the standard Brotherhood laser rifle. Righteous Authority has the lucky effect, filling your VAT's critical meter faster. <laughs> Number 8, Fallout 4 is Good Intentions. Good Intentions belongs to the former Minuteman turned gunner mercenary Clint. You kill Clint and loot it off his body. Clint uses this rifle while wearing a mishmash of T-51B slash T-60 power armor without the helmet. He's located in Quincy. Number 9, Fallout 4's Automatic Laser Musket. The automatic laser musket is given to the player by Sturgis after finishing the nuclear option on the side of the Minutemen. The automatic laser musket doesn't have to be charged to fire, and instead works like a shoulder-fired Gatling laser. There are several other unique AE or 9s that were cut from their respective games. Some, like the lightning gun, seem to be cut at the last minute. So we can see that in the post-war years, while the AAR-9 might be the most common version, individuals and factions are both forwarding the AAR-9 to more powerful designs, just like in the pre-war years. Given the popularity of the design, we can be sure that the AAR will continue to be expanded on in the future. Hopefully Bethesda adds new, unique versions to Fallout 76 in future expansions. I suspect we will also see the AAR in the Fallout TV show, as it's too iconic not to be featured. Alright, that is all. Hope you enjoyed this very long episode. Subscribe to this channel as well as my main channel, Trooper Fofo.